This is a review of the 1970 Ralph Nelson film Soldier Blue, which stars Candace Bergen, Peter Strauss, Donald Pleasance, and Dana Elkar of MacGyver fame. This is an extremely interesting movie. I know I say that about uh, just about everything I review on this channel. Hopefully everything is interesting, um, but this is particularly good um, in that regard. There are books about this movie. Um, let me put it that way. There's a lot to unpack here and a lot to think about. Is this a good movie uh, to watch? Not particularly, uh, but an interesting movie to talk about. I want to start with the plot a little bit. There's one huge thing to know about this film. I'm going to spoil the ending here, but uh, the movie actually spoils itself. The opening uh, credits, the opening title, uh, tells you how the film will end. And uh, that would be a surprise only if you found yourself watching this without somehow having read uh, really anything about this movie, because just about anything you'll find will skip directly to the end and talk about that, really the main event of the film, but not the only thing we're going to talk about today. But point is, is that this movie features um, the Sand Creek Massacre. It's basically a cinematic telling of the Sand Creek Massacre, which was a massacre of a Native American village um, by the U.S. military um, in 1864. I think uh, this it is shown in very graphic um, detail, although detail may or may not be the right word exactly if that's implying some sort of historical accuracy. Um, but it is shown extremely graphically. This, at the time, was potentially one of the most violent movies uh, to have been made in Hollywood. Um, it was one of the mo most violent graphic films that would have been made at all. This was an unstable time for violence in American films where the norms for what was acceptable and what was okay, and also the, the uh, laws, the actual uh, way that films were rated and distributed, was changing um, a lot. Uh, this movie perhaps draws inspiration maybe from some of the Mondo or Giallo films um, in Italy, and perhaps even from some spaghetti westerns to some degree as well. Um, but I'll get back to that. This extremely violent ending is political in this film. Um, this movie is making a case about the exploitation of Native Americans in the United States, without a doubt. But for some people, the ending is a bit sacrilegious, right? For some people, it maybe dishonors uh, the dead to turn it into an exhibition. This response might have been particularly common when the movie was first released, and this level of violence was so unprecedented. Even watching this movie today, though, you might be taken aback by just how graphic and how intense, how unflinching the ending is. Um, like I said, some people take this as some sort of exhibitionism. They take sort of the mondo strain from it, where this is being hammed up, violence for its own sake or something like that, grotesque, gratuitous, and they might find that to be, yeah, disrespectful or something like that. On the other hand, some people might say, well, no, this is what we need, is we need to see events on the big screen as they truly were. We need to drag out the crimes of the past and face up to them or something like that. And perhaps with violence, we can jolt ourselves into an understanding um, of, you know, what people went through or something along those lines. Kind of hard to know. Um, one of the big questions, I think, for me is whether or not this is a shock film. Um, and I honestly don't exactly know the answer. A shock film, you know, implies something superficial, right? Like I said, there's this sort of mondo or giallo strain to it where it's not a dignified, it's not a historical, it's not um, an academic uh, or calculated political statement. A shock film is something uh, less than that in some ways. It's gratuitous, basically. Um, and like I said, there is a case for this to be made as a shock film without a doubt. At the same time, it is obviously a political movie, and anyone who denies that is, <laughs> uh, I don't know what they watched. This movie was made in 1970, um, partly as a proxy to comment on the Vietnam War, um, mainly probably the My Lai Massacre, which would have happened a few years um, earlier in 1968, and which I think was one of the events that sparked production of this film. So inherently political, and some people might say, hey, this movie is doing the good work because it's bringing these things to light. Now, anybody who goes very far down that path is going to have some issues um, because the movie, well, is it accurate? Mm, hard to know uh, about the its portrayal of the actual events, but it is pretty clear that it's not accurate in its portrayal of Native Americans in general. One of the main Native characters, Spotted Wolf, is played by Jorge Rivero, who is a Mexican-American actor, extremely common in Westerns um, from the 30s through 50s, for Native Americans to be, you know, tokenized characters, of course not played by actual Native Americans, just played by someone else with relatively dark skin. Um, and so, like I said, as, as if you go down this path of this movie, fighting the good fight, doing the good work, having its heart in the right 
place. Well, maybe it has its heart in the right place, but does it execute it particularly well? There are many things in this movie that would convince you that it doesn't. But here we have another complicated question, because what actually should our expectations be? How much should we expect films to be accurate? Um, how much should, well, yeah, is it enough to try to do the right thing, but not do it very well? Um, interesting question. A lot of films are open to this kind of a question. For instance, you have the uh, much later film about Native Americans dances with wolves is in some way a breakthrough for Native American representation on screen and in other ways has similar inaccuracies and has a pretty big white savior complex, which this movie suffers from as well. So there are, I don't know if to some people, these are blatant flaws, things that disqualify the rest of the movie. Um, but do they? Should they? Hard to know. This is a movie that will pose those questions. So <laughs> already you can see fairly complicated movie. Is it exploiting Native Americans? Is it exploiting this tragedy for the big screen? Or is it bringing to light crucial history um, that uh, has, has gone unaccounted for? And on top of that, um, how do you reconcile those things with its sort of shoddy portrayal otherwise of certain historical details? Hmm, interesting. This is not just a movie about Native American exploitation. Um, that's the end. That's the big, the big end, the exclamation point. It's hard to, most, most people will think only of that. That's the thing that will leave an impression in your mind. And partly because the, the rest of the movie is really not notable, um, not super interesting, um, and not very memorable. Uh, most of the film is, is kind of an episodic Western. Um, in some ways it reminds me a little bit of kind of the, the episodic and buddy nature of most of Sergio Leone's movies where, uh, you know, there's there's these two sort of pals that go through lots of adventures and misadventures, and just when you think uh, things are going to be straightened out in one way, they things kind of go off in the other direction. You have, like I said, a very episodic um, movie. This this film is in some ways like that, and a lot of the plot, in, to some degree, doesn't doesn't actually make that much sense. Things just kind of happen. Um, it starts out um, with Candace Bergen's character Cresta um, going out with a paymaster who's being guarded um, by a whole bunch of uh, soldiers on horseback or whatever, they get attacked by um, some uh, natives and, who steal the payments, Cresta and one of the soldiers, that's Peter Strauss, they escape, and then Cresta and Peter Strauss, uh, well, Cresta and Honus, that's Peter Strauss' character's name, they have to sort of make do on their own. Um, Cresta is extremely street smart, well, <laughs> I guess it's not street smart, um, but you know what I mean, she was apparently at one time the wife of Spotted Wolf, so she knows plenty about the Native American. She knows plenty about the land, how to survive, and things like that. Honus thinks he knows, uh, but is kind of a puritanical uh, doofus, essentially. <laughs> Neither character is acted very well. Um, Cresta is a somewhat um, endearing character to some degree. Honus is a pretty weak character. In the beginning, the dynamic is kind of confounding. Eventually, you sort of catch on of like, oh, he's an idiot, and that's kind of the point of the movie. And there's a couple sort of funny things. Like I said, this movie goes all over the place and, you know, there are comedic moments in many parts of the film that are not there. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the tone of the film overall, you wouldn't expect necessarily for there to be sort of these comedic buddy comedy things happening throughout, but there are. So like I said, this movie is for the most part kind of a Western. It's from 1970, so this is long past the end sort of of the traditional American Western. Um, we would have a movie like The Searchers from 1956, I think, um, that kind of signals to some people in some ways the closing of the frontier, the end of the Western. People still keep making Westerns for a while, and there's interesting twists on it. For instance, the 1966 film The Professionals is a very interesting uh, Western that's made kind of with the, under a much more subtle specter of uh, social change in the 1960s, a sort of traditional film with some aspects of social change in it that are not anywhere near as ham-fisted as Soldier Blue or anywhere near as In Your Face. Um, those are both sort of mature films about the closing of the frontier to some degrees. This is a very much a political <laughs> um, movie that, like I said, is partly about Native Americans, but it's partly about social changes more generally. So Cresta is this street-smart, savvy, hip, young character, independent woman, and Honus is puritanical, can't wrap its head around her, um, essentially. And this is one of the, yeah, this is one of the main dynamics of the movie. Cresta will swear. She dresses irreverently. She's liberated. Um, interestingly, she may also be exploited at the same time. A very common uh, thing 
in movies of all eras, this one, but also modern movies, is to have maybe a uh, fashionable, independent young woman um, also be a sexual object in the film, right? So some people might praise Wonder Woman or something like that for being a strong ro role model or something along those lines. Um, at the same time, she is a sexual object in the movies. Hmm, kind of interesting. I'm not uh, trying to suggest in any puritanical way that she should wear more clothes or anything like that, but it's interesting how those two issues end up colliding uh, a fair amount. It's perhaps convenient for producers, uh, directors, to have certain costuming choices or something like that um, that may also uh, speak to some people as being uh, freeing or something like that. Uh, this movie has the exact same dynamic going on to the point of farce at some, to some degree. Cresta is in the beginning of the film wearing some big stodgy dress and throughout the movie she keeps tearing bits off of it, uh, much to Honus's dismay who wants her to cover up. She eschews that traditional uh, garb uh, saying it's not suitable, saying it's, uh, it's holding her back, holding her down and such, and giving us really a great um, uh, allegory, a great metaphor for how the traditional lifestyle would have been confining for women, would have been uh, sweltering um, for women. Of course, long history with the huge dresses and smelling salts, women having fainting spells and such, and being very uh, um, clearly imposed on by clothing with no pockets, right? Um, like I said, though, on the other hand, once she starts tearing off most of her clothes, that's when the cameras take, come out to take the picture to put on the cover of the movie, right? That's when she does become, to some degree, a sexual object in the film, which is a bit of a head-scratcher. Again, I'm not making any bold claims here, but this is a very common trend in a lot of movies. Let me generalize, generalize slightly some of the things I've been trying to say. Another question you could ask about this movie is whether it is capitalizing on counterculture. Right, and this is a very this is a very common question to ask of movies from this era. You've got a ton of films that came out in the late '60s or early '70s that are sort of subversive, or that have parts of the subversive uh, community involved in them or depicted in them. You have movies like Easy Riders, The Brisky Point, Medium Cool, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Billy Jack. A huge spectrum there between movies that are truly independent and artistic, well, maybe, that seem a little bit more on that side of things, and movies that are pretty clearly commercial and exploitative that are capitalizing on the counterculture. Remember, at the end of the day, as <laughs> radical as the movie may seem, what the producers are interested in is getting your money, getting you to come into the theaters, getting young people to spend their money in the theaters in particular. So um, all of these movies, regardless of where they are in the spectrum of commercial to artistic, are to some degree implicated in the capitalist business of making the movie. So to some degree, all movies capitalize on the counterculture, but some have it worse than others. An interesting thing about this movie is that the theme from it, the opening theme from this, in fact, has very similar chord progressions to One Tin Soldier, the opening theme to Billy Jack, which is most likely one of the more commercial uh, subversive films out there. The theme for this movie was... Uh, performed by Buffy St. Marie, who interestingly was the first indigenous person to win an Academy Award because she co-wrote, uh, I think, the theme song for An Officer and a Gentleman in the 80s. Um, she is a native Canadian, um, Buffy St. Marie. Anyway, kind of a mess in some degrees. Uh, I think one of the ways to best summarize this movie is that it is potentially... Well, it's fundamentally an exploitative film. It's a movie that is about exploitation, not just in the literal thing, not just about the exploitation of Native Americans, um, but it also had so many interesting lessons contained inside of it, perhaps accidentally, about exploitation in cinema as well. Um, perhaps in the heat of the moment, some people would have been dramatically disappointed or elated by some of the issues or some of the v virtues of this film. As time goes by, though, and this turns, uh, is not a new release anymore, but is an old movie, a historical artifact, it becomes interesting, right? The stories of exploitation that are implicated in the film itself, in the making of the film, become part of the history, become part of the document, right? That's one reason why I think sort of political movies, you know, I'm not super interested, to be honest, in watching modern movies that are preachy, regardless of whose politics they are. A lot of the times you go to the theaters and you see something right now that's kind of preachy. The message is sort of straightforward in some ways. It can take time sometimes 
for these things to reveal themselves, right? It can take time for the deeper dynamics and the deeper stories of the film itself to reveal itself as the movie becomes a historical document. Of course, perhaps by watching some of these older movies, we can get a little bit wiser about what is going on right now. And we are in another period of, uh, to some degree, progressive film, of, to some degree, a thawing, a widening opportunity for non-traditional films to be made and to be made by people who may not have been uh, enfranchised in the industry previously. That's great. And yet, are we capitalizing on the counterculture yet again? Perhaps, right? Are we still uh, treating actors, actresses as sexual objects, uh, even as they are perhaps liberated on screen? Well, perhaps, right? So there are a lot of lessons that might still uh, hold true from Soldier Blue. Um, like I said, this is not a great movie to watch. And so what I recommend it, well, not particularly. There are some interesting things about this, but you can get a lot of this just from reading an article about the film or watching the movie. The film itself is fairly diffuse, kind of boring, a bit odd, doesn't entirely make sense. The acting is really not very good. Some of the cinematography, I think, is probably the best part about this movie. Um, there is some nice cinematography, which is really um, owes a lot to traditional Western cinematography, the big sort of mountainscapes, mountain ranges, horses off in the distance and such. Um, that is a strong point of the movie, but it's one of few. So overall, like I said, a lot of dialectic things in this film, potentially. It's a movie that is potentially an exploitative giallo sort of mondo film, a shock film that is taking a massacre, a horrible moment in history, and playing it up for commercial value, or potentially it's revealing a dark history. At the same time, it has huge critical missteps in its portrayal of Native Americans that might completely... Um, undermine any work it's trying to do, or maybe don't. Um, it's a proxy for political activism of the time. It also is hip in some ways to some of the cultural dynamics of young subversives, um, but it is perhaps exploiting uh, those very young subversives trying to get them to pay their money to come see Soldier Blue in theaters. So <laughs> no surprise that this is a fairly controversial movie because there are a lot of different issues to find yourself on one side or the other of. Overall, pretty interesting movie. Wouldn't totally recommend watching it, but that's Soldier Blue from 1970.